This is lesson 2.4, and today we're going to be talking about waves and light, because waves and light will help us better understand the atom. So our goal today is to better understand light and learn how to calculate the wavelength, frequency, and energy of light. And let's start off today with a question. What is light? Now I'm sure you guys all know that light is a form of energy and that it helps you see things and that it illuminates darkened spaces and all that kind of stuff. But let's answer that question from a more fundamental level. Scientists were pondering this question more than 200 years ago, and they were thinking, is light more like a wave or more like a particle? And by particles, you can imagine something similar to a bullet, right? Particles move in straight lines, like a rock that you throw or a bullet that you shoot. Particles are like that. Waves, however, are more like water waves. And so you can imagine some kind of wave being put through water, and you might see some kind of pattern like this. And so how can you differentiate and say, okay, is light like a particle or a wave? Well, first of all, waves diffract. And so what do I mean by that? So you might get some kind of diffraction pattern like this from a wave. So if this is water and you have a wave propagating through the water, when it comes to some kind of barrier, so you imagine a wall or a barrier here, if you have a hole in the barrier, the wave will spread out. All right. If you have two holes in the barrier, then the wave will spread out and spread out here. And those two spreading outs of waves will interact. And when they interact, you'll get some kind of pattern like this. And you saw this exact pattern in the previous slide, which I'll show you guys again. So this is how waves interact with each other. And you can get some kind of pattern like that. That is known as a diffraction pattern. Bullets, however, won't do that. And particles won't do that. Right? So if you imagine some sort of barrier that a bullet can't go through and you have two holes in the barrier, or two slits in the barrier, when the bullets come here, they'll go through the slits in nice straight lines. They won't interact with each other. You'll get nice straight lines. So that should be a clear way that you can determine is light a particle or a wave. Now, what causes that diffraction pattern seen in waves? The reason for that is simply that waves, when they interact, they will interact either constructively or destructively. So for example, if you have two interacting waves like you see here in the top left right here, when they overlap and their crests are at the same point and their troughs are at the same point, they will add together and make a bigger wave so that the bottoms make a deeper bottom and the tops make a higher top, okay? And so that's how waves interact constructively. Now, what happens if they're out of phase so that the bottom of one wave lines up with the top of another wave? Then they will cancel each other out and that wave will simply disappear. Same thing, if the top over here lines up with the bottom over here, those waves will cancel each other out. So waves can interact constructively or destructively. The exact point at which they interact will determine where they're constructive and where they're destructive and that will give you a pattern such as this. Now, how do we actually test this? Well, it turns out that back in 1801, Thomas Young tested this by simply putting slits in a board and shining light through that, and he found that light actually creates this diffraction pattern. Remember, if light were simply a particle, you would simply get two lines of light on this side. However, that's not what you get. You get a whole diffraction pattern of light over on this side, which means that light must be a wave. Here is an actual picture of a modern reconstruction of his data. And you can see that you get this nice diffraction pattern when you have only two slits for the light to go through. And you also see these colors appear. And the colors appear because light, white light, is composed of more than one wavelength of light. And after a while, over here and here, you're going to get some separation of the light into individual colors. Kind of like what happens in a prism, but a little different. You might say that this now concludes the whole idea of is light a wave or a particle? Yes, it indeed is a wave, but it turns out that that is not the end of the story. So scientists also discovered something known as the photoelectric effect. Now the photoelectric effect is this. When you shine different colors of light or different wavelengths of light at a metal, sometimes nothing happens and sometimes you can actually kick out electrons and electrons will come off from the metal surface and you can have a current flow. 
Now, what's going on? Interestingly enough, light of high frequency will cause the metal to spit out electrons. So for example, you see here green light and blue light can spit out electrons when it hits the metal surface. And the higher the frequency, the faster the electrons, right? So you have, if you have blue light, which has a higher frequency than green light, the electrons will fly out faster. However, if you have light of low frequency, such as in this case, red light, there will be no effect. And that's interesting because there's no effect even if it's a very, very intense light. So you get in super, super powerful red laser, nothing happens. So what's going on? If light were simply a wave, this doesn't really make sense because the energy should build up and still eventually kick out electrons. So light must not simply be a wave. So what's going on? Turns out that Einstein, and he got the Nobel Prize for this, he was able to explain the photoelectric effect this way. He said that light is composed of particles that travel as waves, and those particles are known as photons. And so these photons are simply packets of energy, and if one packet of energy has enough energy to kick out an electron from the metal surface, then an electron will get kicked out. But if the photons or these packets of energy don't have enough energy, then nothing will happen. So your intensity of light is created by having a whole lot of photons. So if you have a super powerful red laser, you have a whole, whole bunch of photons, but not one of them has enough energy to kick out an electron. So nothing will happen. And so light is composed of packets of energy, and it is indeed a particle that travels as a wave. Now, we also notice that the energy of a photon is proportional to frequency. So the higher the frequency of the light, the higher the energy of the electron that gets kicked out. So there's a direct proportionality, higher energy of the photon, higher frequency of the light. Now, light is composed of electromagnetic radiation. In fact, visible light is just one form of electromagnetic radiation. That means as light propagates through space, it generates both an electric field and a magnetic field that oscillate in space. Now, visible light is just one form of electromagnetic radiation and is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's right here in the middle of the electromagnetic spectrum. If you haven't learned this before, make sure you learn it now. It's very, very important. So it goes from radio waves, which are the lowest in energy, to microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-rays, and finally gamma rays. Gamma rays have the highest energy of all of the different forms of electromagnetic radiation. Make sure you learn that and learn it in order. Now, we also need to talk a little bit more about waves in general. And one of the ways that we can measure waves is wavelength. So wavelength, we use the symbol lambda to represent the wavelength. And the wavelength is the length of one complete cycle. So here we have one complete cycle. So going from the top down to the bottom, back up to the top, that is one wave cycle. You can measure the wave cycle from the top to the top, the bottom to the bottom, or the middle to the middle, as you see right here. Now, very important when you measure from the middle to the middle, that you don't stop here, right? From here to here is just half a wavelength. So one wavelength is from here all the way to here, a complete cycle where it goes down, up, and then back down. That is one complete cycle. The wavelength can be measured from a number of different spots. Next, we have the frequency. Very, very important. Sometimes frequency uses the symbol F. Sometimes frequency uses the symbol nu here. It looks like a V. It's actually not. It's the Greek letter nu, which is kind of like an italicized V. So I will be using this symbol. So the symbol nu for frequency. Frequency of a wave is the number of wave cycles per second or the number of wave cycles per unit time. And typically we use hertz to measure frequency. So one hertz is one wave per second. One hertz is one wave per second. And so you can do that in terms of water waves. So you can count the number of waves that hit the beat for a certain amount of time, right? Or you can do it for any kind of wave, whether it's electromagnetic radiation, sound, etc. The speed of a wave can be calculated very simply by multiplying the wavelength times the frequency. Well, how does that make sense? So the wavelength is going to be the distance the wave travels, and the frequency is 
how many waves travel in that time. And so that's going to be the speed of a wave. The speed of a wave is the distance the whole wave travels in a certain amount of time. So the speed is the wavelength times the frequency. Very important equation there. Now, light, we said, is made out of particles called photons, and they all travel as waves. And the speed of light is going to be more or less constant as long as we don't change what light is going through. So the speed of light is a constant, and the constant is this letter C. And it's equal to a constant of 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So this equation right here represents the fact that the speed of a wave or the speed of light equals the wavelength times the frequency. And the speed of light equals 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So in this way, because the speed of light is a constant, if you know the wavelength, you can calculate the frequency. Or if you know the frequency, you can calculate the wavelength. So knowing one of those, you'll always be able to calculate the other one because the speed of light is a constant. Now recall that we also said that the energy of light is proportional to the frequency of light. So as you increase the frequency, you increase the energy of light. So that gives us this equation right here. So the energy of a photon is equal to some constant times the frequency of the light. And H is known as Planck's constant. It's a constant, so it's not going to change. It's just this number right here. You'll notice that this number is very, very small. 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules seconds. That's a terribly, terribly small number. But why is it so small? Because photons are really, really, really small. So it makes sense that these packets of energy are very small. And so our Planck's constant or whatever this constant is in this equation should be very small. So the energy of a photon is this Planck's constant times the frequency of that photon or the frequency of the light. All right, so let's try this sample problem. Sodium lamps are monochromatic. Well, what does that word mean? Mono means one. Chromatic, we're talking about color. So they're monochromatic. They have one single color. Or in other words, they only emit one wavelength of light and they emit light with a wavelength of 589.3 nm. Nm stands for nanometers. So we're going to calculate the frequency and the energy of one photon with that wavelength. And we're going to do it by first calculating the frequency. So let's go ahead and calculate frequency. So we have the equation that C equals lambda nu. So the speed of light equals the wavelength times the frequency. And we here want to calculate, we already know the wavelength, right? So we want to calculate the frequency. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to divide both sides by the wavelength. So this is going to be C over wavelength over wavelength, wavelength over wavelength cancel. And so we get the equation, your frequency is going to be C over the wavelength. And so that's going to get us C. That's going to be 2.998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second divided by a wavelength of 589.3 nanometers. Well, what does nano mean? That means times 10 to the minus 9. Nano means minus 9 meters. And so we can put this in our calculators and you should get used to using this scientific notation in your calculators, all right? And the best way to do it is just to use this functionality in your calculator, the EE. So most calculators are going to have that. If not, you might need to use the times 10 to the power function, but then you'll need to use a whole bunch of parentheses. So let's do this. So it's going to be 2.998 and then I go second comma, which looks on the calculator as this blue EE. But when it shows up here, there's only one small capital E right there. So this is 2.99 E8 divided by, and if we use the E, the exponential format of the calculator, you don't actually need to use parentheses at all because it knows the order of operations is to always do the scientific notation first. We do divided by 589.3 and again second comma negative nine 
That's not minus nine, it's negative nine. So be careful. Most calculators differentiate negative and minus. So your negative button, or at least my negative button is down here. And so that's going to give us an answer. And so that is going to be 5.087. 5.087. And then E14, well, what does that mean? That means 5.087 times 10 to the 14th. Now, what are our units? We have meters per second over meters. And so meters over meters cancel. And so the units are per seconds. So you can go second minus one, right, per seconds. Or you can write it as 5.087 times 10 to the 14 hertz. And that's typically what we do. We do hertz for waves rather than per seconds, but they're the same exact thing. So next, so the energy is equal to h nu. And so it's the h times the frequency. We've just calculated the frequency. And so we can calculate the energy this way. So e equals, and this is a number that you don't need to memorize or anything, but it's going to be 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules seconds. And then times the frequency, right? So 5.087 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Now, if you're doing this in your calculator, you don't need to retype this in. You already have it in your calculator. So you can either store that as something, or all I simply need to do is just hit the times button. That's going to give me the previous answer. Now times something, and I'm going to multiply it by this 6.626 second comma. So it gives me the E negative 34. Now that number is so, so small that our answer is also going to be small, but not quite as small. So the energy is 3.37 and that 3.3709. So the 0 0.9 rounds up to a one times 10 to the negative 19th. Now, what are our units now? So seconds times Hertz cancels out, right? Because Hertz is per seconds. And here's so seconds per seconds that cancels out. And we're left with simply joules as our units. And this number is fairly small, but we'd expect it to be small because this is the energy of one single photon, right? The energy of one single photon should be kind of small because photons are pretty small. So that is a good practice problem to help you guys understand how wavelength, frequency, and energy all interrelate. Also, please, please learn how to use the exponential functions on your calculator so you can do scientific notation fairly easily. One more thing I'd like to talk about is the concept of luminous and illuminated. So different objects behave different ways. So let's see, luminous objects are things that create light. And that's a term that I want you guys to know. So luminous objects are like the sun. They create their own light. Now they're going to appear the same color that they emit. So if the luminous object emits blue light, it's going to look blue. Very, very simple. And illuminated objects, however, are things that reflect light. So for example, the moon. The moon doesn't create its own light. Instead, it reflects the light of the sun so that we can see it. Now, illuminated objects appear the opposite color that they absorb. Well, what do I mean by opposite color? We're going to have to talk about the color wheel to understand that. But before we get into opposite colors, let's make sure we understand luminous and illuminated. So here's an example here. Fireworks. What is that? Is that luminous or illuminated? Well, fireworks, of course, create their own light. So you can see them in the dark. And so fireworks, of course, are luminous. How about this? This car. Is this luminous or illuminated? Well, this is a little bit trickier because this car has lights on it, but the rest of the car is not lighting up. So most of the car is illuminated, except for these headlights. The headlights, of course, are creating their own light, so they are luminous. All the rest of the car is illuminated. So we can see these tires, not because they're creating their own light, but because they are reflecting light from something else. Now, the color wheel is going to be pretty important. So the color wheel you put all of the different colors on the rainbow right here. So we have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, and that's going to be Roy G Biv. There's no indigo in the color wheel. And the color wheel can help you predict the color of various different objects. So we said illuminated objects appear the opposite color that they absorb. And so for example, if a dye looks red, so we have a red shirt, a red object, 
if it appears red, the reason it's appearing red is because it's absorbing green. So it must be absorbing the opposite color that it appears. Now, it turns out it's a little bit more complicated than that. So for example, if it appears dark red, perhaps that means it's absorbing all of the colors except for red, green being the most important. However, if it appears bright red, perhaps that means it's only absorbing green and is reflecting all those other colors. So in general, illuminated objects appear the opposite color that they absorb. The color wheel is fairly useful and fairly simple to reproduce. All you need to do is to remember Roy G. Biv. You may have learned Roy G. Biv with an I in there, but it turns out that indigo is debatable as to whether it's even a color at all. And you just remember those six colors, Roy G. Biv, and we can put it around a circle just like this. So you just draw a circle and you write Roy G. Biv, and it doesn't matter the order you draw it in. So you could draw your circle going clockwise or you could draw the circle and you could start anywhere, literally anywhere. And I could go counterclockwise. I go Roy G. Biv. And it works no matter how you draw it, where you start with the R and whether you go clockwise or counterclockwise, this is going to work. So how does it work? Basically, let's suppose you have a blue shirt. So you have a blue shirt. Well, what color is that blue dye absorbing? It's going to be absorbing the opposite color. So you just look over here. The opposite color is orange. Okay. Or let's suppose you have a purple toy. Well, what's purple? Purple is violet, right? And so if you have some purple toy, it must be absorbing yellow light. Okay. And so you can use this to figure out the color that something's absorbing for any kind of illuminated object. All right, before I sign out, I'd like to recommend that you watch a couple other videos if some of this stuff is not making sense or if you just like to get into a little bit more depth here for understanding light. So this video, the first one, goes over the original double slit experiment. So it's pretty cool and it shows you a bunch of different pictures of how that works. And these two videos go over the wave particle duality of light and the photoelectric effect. So you guys can check those out. And this last one, super cool, it's a song that goes through the electromagnetic spectrum. So if you're having trouble remembering the electromagnetic spectrum, check out this song right here. All right. See you guys. Have a great rest of your day.